so excited to be here with you guys. Um, this is actually my hometown, Kelowna. I grew up here. So I'm Sam, and I'm a filmmaker and a writer. And uh, when I was young, I didn't dream of growing up to be a filmmaker. I dreamt of growing up to be a Ninja Turtle. It's okay, you can laugh at me. It's worth laughing at. I was, I was dressed as Michelangelo. Actually, I thought it was. My mom got me red, but, which is Raphael's colors, but it's okay. We all know Michelangelo is the best Ninja Turtle. <laughs> so I would watch the Ninja Turtles and, and think to myself, I can do that. I can be a hero like those guys. Because as that great perceiver of the human condition, Jerry Seinfeld, once said. When men are growing up and reading about Batman, Superman, Spider-Man, these aren't fantasies. These are options. <laughs> and so for me, I thought it was a real option to grow up to be a Ninja Turtle. So I would watch the show, and then I would start jumping off the couch, practicing my ninja moves. Because this is what you do after watching your favorite film or show when you're a kid. You try to act them out. And I knew that the first step, you, you couldn't just decide to be a Ninja Turtle. First, you had to go through training. And the best part of training was always the jump kicks. So I would try them off of the couch. And then my parents would sit me down and politely explain to me, Sam, you can't grow up to be a ninja. I'm sorry. You should probably try to be something more safe and practical. And when you need your fix, you can always watch whichever superhero film Hollywood has at the ready. And as I grew up, my appreciation and my interaction with stories began to change. I stopped coming home and jumping off the couch. Isn't it interesting how adults treat movies so much differently than children do? So we grown-ups, we go to the, to the movies and we see a great film, and then we move on. We don't jump off the couch, we don't come home and start training, because we judge, ability, we judge movies not based on their ability to inspire us to change the world, but on their ability to distract us from the world. Whereas kids see movies completely differently. When a kid goes to a great movie, what do they want to do? They want to watch it again, and again, and again, and again. They want to ingest it. They want to make every single part of the movie a part of their lives. They want that story to define them. And it does define them. It informs what clothes they wear, what snacks they eat, what pajamas they have, what bed sheets they have, what games they play, what toys they buy, all defined by their favorite story. That's why there's probably such a thing as Star Wars lunch meats or Harry Potter shampoo. <laughs> so kids just naturally understand that stories are guides to life. They see a story and they want to act it out. They want to be defined by their favorite story. I think this is actually a very natural way of approaching story. In fact, we've done it for generations. And there just happens to be some stories that sort of stand the test of time, that resonate through the generations, through cultures, and so on. So a couple of years ago, I was reading a book by a guy named Joseph Campbell that he wrote in the 50s. The book's called The Hero with a Thousand Faces. And in it, he talks about an idea uh, of, it's called The Hero's Journey. And his idea is that through many cultures and through, throughout history, we've told all these hero stories, and they all happen to follow a similar structure. So he goes through the structure, and he shows you about the same 12 steps or so that happen in all of these stories, and he shows you. And I was blown away. And at the same time, I was watching the Harry Potter movies because the next Harry Potter was about to come out, and that's what you do, right? You watch all the movies before the next one comes out. I'm kind of sad that it's over. And, uh, and I noticed that Harry Potter checks a lot of these boxes that, that Joseph Campbell was talking about. And then I read another book um, by Chris Vogler called The Writer's Journey, and he talks about how Hollywood has actually figured out that Joseph Campbell's theory makes for a great story, and so they've turned it into a secret formula for all these blockbuster movies, which is a little bit disconcerting because it was like pulling back the, the, uh, the curtain of The Wizard of Oz and just seeing an old man pulling levers in the back because I felt like I was being manipulated by Hollywood. But instead of choosing to just let it be and go on my merry way, I wanted to dig a little bit further. So I started watching Lord of the Rings, and I started watching Star Wars, because they're all some of my favorite films. And I found out, I was watching the movies and thinking to myself, unbelievable, these tell almost exactly the same story. So I'm sure you're, 
ready to ask, what is that story? What is that secret formula? So let's do it, but pay attention, okay? The secret formula of Hollywood is that you start with an orphan living in an ordinary world in a sort of exile that's unaware of what's really going on in the universe, when along comes a wizard who offers to mentor the orphan, calls him to adventure. At first, the orphan leaves, refuses the call, but then he accepts the call, goes on the adventure with the mentor wizard, makes a series of friends, goes on a number of challenges, learns a series of lessons culminating in the ultimate lesson, which is that before you can defeat the evil that exists out there, you have to defeat the evil that exists in here. Then the mentor steps in to sacrifice himself to save the hero, although death is not the end. The mentor will be resurrected. But the hero doesn't know this. And the hero comes to a moment of truth where the cause grips him. And he must decide whether it's worth it to give his life to the cause. And of course, he does. And then he comes within an inch of death, and he is miraculously rescued only to return to become a hero to the next generation, a mentor to the next generation of heroes. Right? Do you remember? Okay, some of you don't. (laughs) So we'll back up. We'll go through it a little bit quicker. So we were talking about Lord of the Rings, Star Wars, and Harry Potter. So Frodo, Harry Potter, and Luke Skywalker were all orphans. At least we thought Luke was an orphan. Spoiler alert, I'm sorry if I spoiled that for you. Where have you been? (laughs) Only the most famous line in cinematic history. (laughs) All orphans living in Little Whinging, um, the Shire, and Tatooine where they're really unaware of what's really going on in the universe, when along comes a wizard, Gandalf, Dumbledore, via letter in Harry Potter, and uh, the other guy, (laughs) Obi-Wan Kenobi, of course, who is actually referred to as a wizard by Uncle Ben. And they call them to adventure, and at first the hero has an excuse. No, I have to stay at the farm. I can't be a wizard. (laughs) And you take the ring, Gandalf. (laughs) Before accepting the call to adventure and going with the wizard on the adventure. Then they meet some friends, and they start their training, because this is very important. Part of the process to becoming a hero is your training, and your training is both lessons and challenges. So about seven of the Harry Potter movies are all just training. (laughs) Frodo gets through it pretty quick. He gets through it like chapter one, the first movies. They train him on the fly as they're going. (laughs) And then, of course, Luke goes through training with Yoda. And in their training, they learn the ultimate lesson, that before you can defeat the evil that exists out there, you have to fight the evil that exists in here. So Frodo has to deal with his temptation to use the ring. Harry Potter has to deal with his desire for vengeance. And Luke Skywalker has to deal with the temptation to join the dark side. And before they can fight the evil out there, they have to deal with those issues in their own heart. And then the mentor steps in to sacrifice himself to save the hero. Obi-Wan fights Vader and dies. Gandalf fights the Balrog and dies, or so we think. (laughs) And I won't tell you Harry Potter because it happens like six times. (laughs) All different, they're just all dying for Harry Potter. (laughs) And so then the hero comes to to a point where his friends are in danger and he must decide whether he's going to give himself to the cause. So Frodo and Sam come to a point where they don't have enough food for the return journey and Frodo says to Sam, there never was a return journey, Sam. And Luke Skywalker fights Darth Vader. Who's his father? Sorry. He fights Darth Vader, and Darth Vader says, join me, and he says, never, and he jumps off the platform to a certain death. And Harry Potter goes to fight Voldemort, because Voldemort calls him out, and he goes to a certain doom, only to be miraculously rescued each time, and then return to become a mentor of the next generation of heroes. This is the story that resonates with us. So why is this story, this pattern, so compelling? I don't, I don't really know. But I I looked up the numbers, the box office numbers, and I found out that of all film franchises that tell one linear story, these are the biggest selling film franchises of all time. These three stories that all tell the same story. I can't tell you why. We are so drawn to the story, but Hollywood keeps telling it over and over again, and we keep paying for tickets. So the next question obviously is then, If stories are our guides to life, what does it look like to apply that story to my life? So I've picked about five steps, because we could get into everything. But uh, I don't think that you should just wait at home waiting for a wizard to come along and offer to take you on an adventure. (laughs) By the way, the next step is that they go to a dingy bar (laughs) in every film, and then they fight a troll. (laughs) 
So I'm going to focus on five steps. The first step, so where do we start in each story? We start with an orphan. Why an orphan? Because we love orphans. You feel sorry for an orphan. How can you not feel bad for an orphan? They make them orphans because we care for them instantly, right? So your weakness actually makes you a compelling character. Whoops. I'm just going to put this down. <laughs> your weakness makes you a compelling character. If you were a perfect person, nobody would care about your story. So for little Sam, his weakness was that he wasn't a ninja. But I'm just kidding, actually. If I'm being honest, in the spirit of uh, my favorite TED Talk, which is Brene Brown's Power of Vulnerability, my weakness is that I don't care a lot about others. I mostly care about myself. And part of my hero journey in life will be overcoming that weakness and figuring out a way to become a kinder, more empathetic person. So what's the next step? The first step is weakness. The next step is adventure. Being willing to leave your ordinary world. Not only to see what's out there, but to see who you become out there. Often this starts with being called by a mentor, and maybe you have a great mentor, and that's great, but maybe you need to find a mentor, or maybe you just need to listen to those voices of the generations that have gone past, of those that have sacrificed themselves to save us. So, weakness and adventure. The third step is training. Now, training does not look like jumping off the couch, unfortunately. <laughs> it looks like going through a series of challenges. And most of life is going through challenges that prepare you, that build your character, and learning lessons that will serve you. And it's important to keep the end goal in mind, that just in some small way, you may become like your heroes. It's also important to find friends who support you on your journey and to be a supportive friend, because it's more fun to do it with other people. All this in preparation of learning the ultimate lesson, which is that before you can defeat the evil that exists out there, you have to defeat the evil that exists in here. Whether that's despair or fear or anger or greed. Do you remember that scene in Star Wars Empire Strikes Back where Luke is training with Master Yoda? All the Star Wars nerds here are just loving it, right? <laughs> <laughs> I know, I'm one too. I also wanted to be Luke Skywalker, but it's more original, be a Ninja Turtle. So Luke, Luke's training with Master Yoda, and Yoda sends him into a cave, and in the cave he finds Darth Vader, and he fights Darth Vader, and he cuts off his head, only for the mask to come off, and he sees his own face. So he asks Yoda, what was that all about? That's a direct quote. <laughs> but here's one, and Yoda says to him, or he asks, he asks Master Yoda, what was in that cave? And Yoda says, only what you brought with you. And then what happens? Luke finds out that his friends are in danger, that it's a trap. They're about to be taken by the Empire. So he, he leaves his training, and he goes, and he fights Vader, and he has a moment of truth. And a moment of truth doesn't come along every day. Because it's the moment that defines your story. Because how would this story have ended if Luke Skywalker was like, oh yeah, that sounds pretty good. I guess I'll join the dark side. I don't really want to jump off this platform to my certain death. <laughs> so, okay. Does Luke do what is safe? Or does he do what is hard? He takes the hero's option. And he jumps off to a certain death rather than selling out and joining the dark side. This is his moment of truth. What's your moment of truth? It may not come along every day. Maybe it's the day you become a parent or the day you get married. So the moment of truth, it's, it's the climax of the story where the hero is defined by his action. Do you remember what that line from Batman Begins is? I had to throw a Batman quote in here somewhere. <laughs> the line is, it's not who you are underneath, but what you do that defines you. What you do in that moment of truth defines you. And then after you've experienced the moment of truth, after the cause has asked you to give your life to, to it, Maybe it's not your life, maybe it's Jerry Maguire. Like, like Jerry Maguire, it's giving your job or your reputation, your comfortable lifestyle. After you've experienced the moment of truth, will you return home and become a mentor to the next generation of heroes? Maybe that looks like being a coach or an uncle or a leader in your community or just taking someone out for coffee who looks lost and needs encouragement. So those are the five steps, weakness, adventure, Training, moment of truth, and the return. Now, I actually have a friend in Liberia right now who I talked to her about these steps, and she's like, those really resonate with me. Um, I was there about a year ago, 
I was working on a documentary project, and I met this girl, Katie, who's about my age, and she's from New Jersey. And she had a bit of a rough childhood. She had a tough, tough home life. I won't get into any details. And she got the chance to go on an adventure to West Africa. And there she met some young girls who are forced to prostitute themselves to pay for school and food. And she was grabbed by this cause. This cause compelled her towards action. And with the encouragement of friends and mentors, she moved to Liberia and set up a school for these girls. Her organization is called More Than Me. You can check it out. And then what happened? Ebola came to Liberia a few months ago. I don't know if you've heard. And so Katie left to protect herself. And then she got the worst news imaginable. Ebola had come to Liberia. This is a picture I took of Katie when I was there. Ebola had come to West Point, the community in which she worked. So what did she do? Did she take the hard or the safe and comfortable option? Did she just expect somebody else to do it? No, she actually packed up 12 suitcases full of medical supplies, flew back to Liberia, and she's there right now saving people's lives every day and making sure that the community gets educated about like, Ebola. Now, we are not all like Katie. I'm not in Liberia. I could be. I have friends there. We are not all like Luke and Harry and Frodo. But we can still be like our heroes in some small way. What is your weakness? What is your ordinary world? And are you willing to see what's beyond it? What's your adventure? Do you see your life as a series of challenges, of lessons? Have you learned the ultimate lesson? That before you can defeat the evil that exists out there, you have to defeat the evil that exists in here. What will you do during your moment of truth? When that moment comes, Will you be willing to give your life to it? Because what is a hero if not someone who's willing to sacrifice themselves for their friends? Will you become a mentor to the next generation of heroes? What will you say to your children and to that childlike voice inside of you that still wants to act out their favorite stories, that still wants to be like their heroes? Will you say, no, choose something more safe? Or will you say, go for it, jump off that couch, you can be the hero? Thank you.